It's finally time to call forth the power of copper. Hi, I'm Miss Razor, and welcome back to Redstone from Zero, a series where I teach you redstone from its foundations, assuming you come in knowing absolutely nothing about it. As always, I recommend starting with episode zero, but I'll do my best to be comprehensible, even if you haven't. I've been looking forward to today's topic for a long time, the copper bulb. At first, the copper bulb might seem just like a fancy redstone lamp, but it's so much more than that, especially for bedrock players, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Let's start with the block's properties. The oxidation level and waxed or unwaxed status of a copper bulb doesn't affect its redstone properties at all. It's purely a visual and light level difference, with one exception. Obviously, if you have an observer watching a copper bulb that oxidizes, gets waxed, or gets scraped, the observer will detect that change. So if you have an observer watching a copper bulb, make sure it's either fully oxidized or waxed, so it won't trigger the observer at a time you didn't expect due to oxidation. Copper bulbs are a transparent block for redstone purposes, and have four different block states, two of which are light emitting states. When a copper bulb is lit, a comparator will read a signal strength of 15 from it. When it's unlit, a comparator will read a signal strength of zero from it. And while for most other redstone components, being powered and being on are the same thing, the copper bulb is different. As you'd expect, when the copper bulb is lit, it's on, and when it's unlit, it's off. That part shouldn't be surprising at all. But there's also a little red dot in the middle of each block face that tells whether the copper bulb is powered. If the red dot is present, the bulb is powered. If the red dot is missing, the bulb is unpowered. This is completely separate from whether the copper bulb is on or off. It's not just possible, but common, for a copper bulb to be powered and off, or unpowered and on. Powering the copper bulb makes it change between on and off, but only in a very specific way. The copper bulb only changes between on and off on the rising edge of a redstone pulse. That is, the copper bulb will only toggle between its on and off states when changing from unpowered to powered, or in other words, when its redstone input goes from off to on. And that means if you toggle a copper bulb's on-off state by powering it, and then keep powering it, you can force it to stay in its current state, because copper bulbs need a rising edge to change on-off states, and you can't have a rising edge on something that's already powered. It's like those retractable ballpoint pens where you push in the click cap on the back until it clicks, and that's how it makes the pen tip switch between being extended and being retracted. If you keep your non-existent Minecraft thumb, Holding the click cap down, in this analogy, keep providing a redstone signal, it doesn't matter how many other people try to click the cap to make the pen tip retract, it won't click again. Not until you've let go of it, and then they can press it again to retract the pen tip. Likewise, it's not until you let the copper bulb go unpowered that it again becomes able to switch between off and on. And since a comparator output from the copper bulb is constant until the bulb changes between lit and unlit on a rising edge, that means that you can use a copper bulb to change short redstone pulses into long redstone signals. Now, some of you are thinking, hey, wait a minute, all of this sounds familiar. And you're right, it should sound familiar. Because the behavior I'm describing is the behavior of a T flip-flop. That's right, a copper bulb with a comparator reading from it forms a complete T flip-flop with just those two blocks. So now let's take the T flip-flop from lesson three and set it side by side with a copper bulb and comparator to show they have the same behavior. When I power them on, the redstone lamp swaps between off and on, as expected. Holding the redstone signal doesn't make anything change no matter how long I do it. Removing the redstone power, then supplying it again, makes the redstone lamp turn off. And you can do almost whatever you want to the input, and the two T flip-flops will act the same. The only exception I found is when bombarding them with one tick pulses in rapid succession, such as from a double observer clock. In that case, they desynchronize with each other and start to act a little weird. So if you're going to be dealing with rapid one-tick pulses coming into your T flip-flop, just make sure it behaves the way you expect before you go basing your whole build around it. Anyway, what's nice about using the copper bulb and comparator T flip-flop, which is sometimes called a copper flop, instead of the sticky piston and redstone block T flip-flop, is that it's more compact and takes less materials to construct. But what's really great about it is that it works the same in all game editions. So Bedrock players, rejoice! Your T flip-flop has arrived in the form of the copper bulb. Now let's talk about useful ways to use copper bulbs as T-flip-flops. Pretty much any use I can think of for the sticky piston and redstone block T-flip-flop 
will also work for the copper flop and vice versa, so all of those count. But specifically, you may remember way back in lesson zero, I mentioned that sending redstone signals downward is tricky. Now we're finally going to talk about the solution to that problem, or a solution to that problem at least. This is far from the only way to do it. So let's talk about walls. No, not the kind made of full blocks. I mean the wall blocks themselves, like the andesite wall, cobblestone wall, nether brick wall, and quartz wall, which doesn't exist but should and I'm complaining about it, and so on. When you have three wall blocks all in a row, they connect. And specifically, the middle wall block just kind of goes thin in the middle, while the two ends keep their column. But if you put something next to it that the wall can attach to, it makes the middle part of the wall regain its column too. And not just that wall block, it also affects all the wall blocks below it. So if you have a three wide wall of any height, you can put something next to it way up at the top and it will form a column all the way down to the bottom, which we can detect with an observer. So what does any of this have to do with a copper bulb? You may be wondering. Recall that the observer and the T flip flop are kind of like opposites. An observer watching redstone dust or powered rails turns long redstone signals into short pulses and the T flip-flop turns short pulses into long redstone signals. But observers don't only work by watching redstone dust or powered rails. They work on anything that triggers a block state change. So if you have your redstone line up at the top, attached to something that can make the middle wall form a column, like a trapdoor, and an observer at the bottom, the observer will trigger whenever the upper redstone line turns on, and whenever it turns off. And if you have a T flip-flop attached to the observer, like, say, a copper bulb and comparator, then the comparator output at the bottom will be the same as the redstone line input at the top, but two redstone ticks later because of the delay added by the observer and the comparator. Meaning, using a trapdoor, walls, an observer, a comparator, and a copper bulb, we can easily send redstone signals downward as far as we want. On bedrock, though, keep in mind that the change in the wall will visibly propagate downward, so while this method also works on bedrock, it is slower, and the time it takes depends on the vertical distance traveled. Something else neat you can do with copper bulbs that's actually surprisingly easy is make a binary number counter. Literally all you have to do is chain a bunch of copper bulbs together with comparators, and they will form a binary counter. With the caveat that the bulb being off represents 1 and the bulb being on represents 0. Each time I toggle the first copper bulb, the count increases by 1. Of course, you'll only be able to see that if you have some level of understanding of binary. Speaking of which, I'm considering doing a full episode on binary, not introducing a new redstone component, just doing a deep dive into what binary is, how it works, and why it's going to be so useful for us as redstoners. Let me know what you think in the comments, even if it's just yes binary lesson or no binary lesson. I'll need to explain it at some point regardless, but this will help determine how in-depth we'll go. As always, I'll do my best to make even a deep dive comprehensible to everyone. Another useful circuit you can build with copper bulbs is called an SR latch. You'll see these referred to as RS latches, RS nor latches, and other things like that. In actual electronics, these distinctions matter. But in redstone, you can think of them as basically equivalent. The SR in SR latch stands for set, reset. That is, unlike a T flip-flop, where you'll recall the T stands for toggle, that has a single input that toggles the output between on and off, in an SR latch, you have two separate inputs, one that turns the output on, the set, and one that turns the output off, the reset. There are several ways to construct an SR latch, but this is a particularly nice one by user StrangeDish2532 on Reddit. The input to the lower left comparator, which is currently a lever, is the set input. It can turn the copper bulb on when it's off, and does nothing when the copper bulb is on. The input to the lower right comparator, which is also a lever here, is the reset input. It can turn the copper bulb off when it's on, and does nothing when the copper bulb is off. For the SR latch's output, you can either use the smooth stone block as the beginning of your output line, since it will always be powered when the copper bulb is on, and will always be unpowered when the copper bulb is off, or you can just attach a comparator reading from the copper bulb in the only space it has left to do so. Either one would work. So let's talk about how this works, step by step. We'll start off with just a copper bulb with a comparator reading from it. A basic copper flop. We want a way to turn it on and turn it off, so we'll place the two levers with comparators pointing into the copper bulb. Right now, either lever can turn the copper bulb on or off. It's still just a T-flip flop. To restrict that, we'll need some way to block each lever's redstone power from reaching the copper bulb, and the way we do that here is by putting both of the lever comparators in subtract mode. 
That way, all we have to do is find a way to supply a side input of 15 to the subtract mode comparators, and then even an input signal strength of 15 will get zeroed out before it can reach the copper bowl. So the next hurdle to overcome is to determine how to supply a side input of 15 to the left lever's comparator when the copper bulb is on, and to the right lever's comparator when the copper bulb is off. That's where the smooth stone block comes in, although any old building block would work. When the copper bulb is on, the smooth stone block will be powered with a signal strength of 15, which means that if we put a redstone dust line to the left of it, we'll have our secondary input for the left lever's comparator, able to subtract the set signal down to zero whenever the copper bulb is on. And if we attach a redstone torch to the right side of the smooth stone block, then it will become powered only when the copper bulb is off, because that's when the smooth stone block will be unpowered. In fact, an understanding of how redstone torches are inverters should make it clear that the left redstone dust and the right redstone torch will never be on at the same time, which is exactly what we want. So the only thing to do from here is to route the dust and torches redstone signals to their corresponding subtract mode comparators. I initially built this to do that with comparators, but repeaters would work just as well. And between you and me, you could even use redstone dust, but only for the right side. It wouldn't work for the left side because the redstone signal would decay down to 14 before reaching the left subtract mode comparator, which would allow signals of strength 15 to get through even when the copper bulb is on, which we don't want. So I typically build it with three comparators and two repeaters, just because repeaters are slightly cheaper to craft. These are useful for cases where you have separate conditions that control when you want to turn something on and when you want it to turn off. Or, more specifically, they're really useful for when you don't necessarily know whether the output is on or off, but you want to make sure it's now off. Or you want to make sure it's now on. If you tried to turn a T flip-flop on, but it was in an unknown state, it would either be already on and you incorrectly turned it off, or it would be off and you correctly turned it on. Now, obviously, you can take the existing output of a T flip-flop and make it so the off switch only works when it's on, and the on switch only works when it's off. But in that case, whatever circuit you build to do that will in fact just be another way to construct an SR latch. But let's take this abstract concept of the T flip-flop being in an unknown state and show a concrete example, something that should drive home what it means for it to be in an unknown state, even though you can look at it, as well as why SR latches are useful. And by that I mean, let's get to this lesson's cool thing you can build. This time, it's an improved digital number display. The weakness in the previous one from Lesson 4 was that the display had to be blank before you could show a new number, or the display would get messed up. Or more specifically, we had to make sure all segments of the display were in a known state, off, for the buttons that showed numbers to work correctly. This new display makes sure the display always lights up the correct segments, no matter what their previous state was. That's the power of the SR latch. But let's get into the pieces of this, because much like the previous digital number display, this is something you can absolutely build yourself, and it's much less complicated than it looks. We'll start with this narrower SR latch. This replaces the sticky piston T flip-flops used in the Lesson 4 digital number display. The lower observer is the set, and the upper observer is the reset. When the copper bulb is off, its comparator output is zero, leaving the target block unpowered, meaning the redstone torch is powered. That powers the block above it, which the repeater propagates forward into the block next to the redstone dust. This powers the redstone dust and prevents the upper observer reset line from turning the copper bulb back on, much like when we held down the click cap of the pen earlier. So the way you turn the copper bulb on is by using the lower observer set line to power the target block, which depowers the torch, then the repeater, then the redstone dust temporarily. And when the two tick signal from the lower observer outputting through the two tick delay repeater ends, the target block becomes depowered again, which powers the torch, then the repeater, then the redstone dust, turning the copper bulb on. When the copper bulb is on, it powers the target block, which both blocks the way for the lower observer set line by keeping the target block powered, preventing any additional redstone power to the target block from doing anything, as well as clears the way for the upper observer's reset line by depowering the redstone torch that would otherwise power the redstone dust on top of the copper bulb. But ultimately, all you really need to know about it is that it's an SR latch. Knowing the intricate details of how this particular SR latch works can be useful at times, but likewise, being able to blur away the details and think about it just as an SR latch is also a useful skill. So just know that instead of using plain T flip-flops, this improved digital number display replaces each one with an SR latch instead, and that the lower line is the set line, while the upper line is the reset line. 
Next, we'll look at the signal encoder. On the left, we have a copy of the signal encoder from the Lesson 4 digital number display. On the right, we have the bottom half of the signal encoder from this lesson's improved digital number display. And to make things easier to see, let's get rid of the power rails on top. Notice that they are exactly the same. This is not a coincidence. This is because the Lesson 4 display had to start with all redstone lamp segments off, then power the correct ones on when the button went down, and depower those same ones when the button came back up. In other words, what was encoded here for the Lesson 4 digital number display was what segments need to turn on for a given number. And we're doing the exact same thing in the lower encoder of the improved display, but instead of turning them on and then off, we're turning them on and leaving them on. And we can get away with doing that because there's a second encoder above the lower encoder. And that upper encoder encodes what segments need to be off for a given number. And if you look closely at the upper encoder with the rails removed, you'll see that it's exactly the same as the lower encoder, except that the observers and smooth stone have been swapped. Everywhere with an observer below has a smooth stone block above, and everywhere with a smooth stone block below has an observer above. Because the lower encoder encodes what segments need to be on, and the upper encoder encodes what segments need to be off, and it's impossible for a segment to be both on and off at the same time, so of course everywhere that isn't turned on below needs to be turned off above. That's just saying, turn on everything you need and turn off everything you don't need. Which is why we can get away with turning on segments and leaving them on, because we know the next number will clean up anything left over that it doesn't need. And all of that is just a long, detailed way of saying the lower encoder sends all the set signals we need, and the upper encoder sends all the reset signals we need. So just hook up the lower encoder purple line with the purple SR latch set, and the upper encoder purple line with the purple SR latch reset, blue with blue, and so on for each color, and everything will just work. If you're struggling to understand this build, I recommend going back and reviewing the digital number display in Lesson 4, because it works under exactly the same principles as this one, except it uses T flip-flops instead of SR latches, and because of that, it only uses one signal encoder instead of two. Before we end, Let's review what we talked about today. 1. A copper bulb being powered and being on are not the same thing. A copper bulb can be any combination of on slash off and powered slash unpowered. 2. A copper bulb only changes between on and off on the rising edge of a redstone signal. This means if you continually supply power to a copper bulb, you can prevent it from changing between off and on, just like with the pen analogy. 3. A copper bulb plus a comparator is a complete T-flip-flop in just two blocks. 4. You can use walls, an observer, and a T-flip-flop to send redstone signals downward as far as you want with ease. 5. You can use copper bulbs to create SR latches, which you have more control over than T-flip-flops. The S stands for set, and the R stands for reset. As always, if you have questions or something was confusing, leave a comment and I'll do my best to explain things to you. If you enjoyed this episode and think it deserves a like, I greatly appreciate it. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe as well. It really helps out the channel. And with that, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!